Book of Heaven, Volume 14, Part 8 July 20th, 1922 The living in the divine will must graft in the soul everything that the divine will did and made Jesus suffer in his humanity. The Most Holy Trinity, veiled upon earth. As I was in my usual state, my always lovable Jesus came and plunged me so deep into his will that even if I wanted to go out, it would have been impossible for me. It happened to me as to a person who has voluntarily allowed himself to be flung from his little place into an interminable place. And in seeing the length of the way, of which he knows not even the boundaries, he gives up the thought of tracing his little place. But he is happy with his lot. So while I was swimming in the immense sea of the divine will, my sweet Jesus told me, Dearest daughter of my will, I want to make of you a repeater of my life. The living in my will must graft in the soul everything that my will did and made me suffer in my humanity. It tolerates no dissimilarity. See, my eternal will imposed on my humanity to accept as many deaths for as many creatures as would have life in the light of the day. And my humanity accepted these deaths with love, so much so that the eternal volition made as many marks in my humanity for as many deaths as I was to suffer. Now, would you want me to mark yours with as many marks as mine received, so that you may suffer as many deaths as I suffered? I pronounced the fiat and Jesus with mastery and speed together marked mine with as many marks of death, or as many as he had, saying to me, Be attentive and strong in suffering these deaths, more so, since from these deaths life shall come out for as many other creatures. Now while he was saying this, he touched me with his own creative hands, and as he touched me, he created suffering, such as to make me feel mortal pains. He tore my heart and wounded it in a thousand ways. Now with arrows of fire, now with arrows so ice cold as to make me numb. Now he squeezed it so tightly that I remained immobile. But who can say everything? He alone can say what he does. I felt crushed, annihilated, and I almost feared I didn't have the strength. And he, as though wanting to rest from the pains he had given me, continued, saying, What do you fear? Perhaps that my will may not have enough strength to sustain you in the pains I want to give you? or that you might go out of the boundaries of my will? This shall never be. Don't you see how many immenses my will has extended around you, in such a way that you yourself cannot find the way out? All the truths, the effects, the values, the knowledges I have manifested to you have been as many seas by which you have been surrounded. And yet more seas shall I continue to extend. Courage, my daughter. All this is necessary to the sanctity of living in my will, to generate likeness between me and the soul. So I did with my mamma. I did not tolerate even one little pain, or any act or good that I did, in which she would not participate. 
one was the will that animated us. And therefore, when I suffered deaths and pains, or when I operated, she would die, suffer, operate, together with me. In her soul, she was to be my faithful copy, in such a way that, in reflecting myself in her, I was to find another me. Now what I did with my mamma, I want to do with you. After her, I place you. I want the most holy trinity to be veiled upon earth. Myself, my mamma, and you. And this is necessary, that by means of a creature, my will may have operating life upon earth. And how can it have this operating life if I do not give what my will contains and what it made my humanity suffer? My will had true operating life in me and in my inseparable mamma. Now I want it to have it in you. One creature is absolutely necessary to me. So has my will established. The others shall be conditional. I felt all confounded. I comprehended what Jesus was saying, and I felt my poor being more annihilated, undone. I felt so unworthy that I thought to myself, what a mistake Jesus is making. There are so many good souls that he could choose. But while I was thinking of this within myself, he added, Poor daughter, your littleness near me dissolves. But so I have decided. I had to take her from the human race. Had I not taken you, I would have taken another creature. But since you are littler, I raised you on my knees. I nourished you at my breast like a little baby. So I feel my own life in you, and therefore I fixed my gaze upon you. I looked at you over and over again, and pleased, I called the Father and the Holy Spirit to look at you, and with unanimous consensus, we chose you. Therefore there is nothing left for you but to be faithful to me, and to embrace with love the life, the pains, the effects, and everything that our will wants. July 24th, 1922. Bonds between Jesus and each soul. Correspondence to Grace. Continuing in my usual state, my always lovable Jesus came with an enchanting majesty and love and showed me all generations, from the first to the last man. And each of them was bound and tied together with my sweet Jesus. And the tying was such that it seemed to multiply for each creature, in such a way that each one had him for himself alone. And Jesus gave that life of his to suffer any pain and death that each one would have to suffer so as to be able to say to the Celestial Father, My Father, in each creature you shall have as many of myself, who shall give you, for each one, what each one owes you. While I was seeing this, my sweet Jesus told me, My daughter, do you also want to accept the bond with each being, so that there may be no dissimilarity between you and me? I don't know how. I felt as if the weight of all was leaning on my shoulders. I saw my unworthiness and weakness, and I felt such repugnance as to feel faint, to the point that blessed Jesus, having compassion for me, took me in his arms and pressed me to his heart, letting me place my mouth at the opening of the wound that pierced him saying to me, 
Drink, my daughter, the blood that gushes forth from this wound, that you may receive the strength that you lack. Courage, do not fear. I shall be with you. We shall share together all the weight, the work, the pains, and the deaths. This is why I tell you, be attentive and faithful, because my grace wants correspondence. Otherwise it takes nothing to descend. What does it take to open and to close one's eyes? It takes nothing. Yet the great good of keeping them open and the great harm of keeping them closed. By keeping them open, the eyes are filled with light, with sun. With this light, the hand can operate. The foot can walk safely and without stumbling. One can distinguish objects, whether they are good or bad. One can reorder things, read, write. Now what does it take to lose all this good? Closing one's eyes. The hand cannot operate, the foot cannot walk, and if it does, it is subject to stumbling. One can no longer distinguish objects. He reduces himself to inability. Such is the correspondence. Nothing other than opening the eyes of the soul. And as she opens them, Light comes into the mind. My image is reflected in everything she does, copying me faithfully. In such a way that she does nothing other than receive continuous light from me, so as to convert her whole being into light. On the other hand, lack of correspondence plunges the soul into darkness and renders her inoperative. July 28, 1922 Likeness of the soul to Jesus, not only in the deaths of pain, but also in those of love. I felt all immersed in his most holy will, and my sweet Jesus on coming told me, My daughter, Identify your intelligence with mine, so that yours may circulate in all the intelligences of creatures, and receive the bond of each of their thoughts, in order to substitute them with as many other thoughts done in my will. And I may receive the glory as if all thoughts were done in a divine manner. Expand your will in mine. Nothing must escape you that is not caught in the net of your will and mine. My will in me and my will in you must blend together and have the same interminable boundaries. But I need that your will be willing to extend within mine and that not one thing created by me escape it, so that in all things I may hear the echo of the divine will in the human will and I may generate my likeness in it. See, my daughter, I suffered double deaths for each creature, one of love and another of pain. In fact, in creating man, I created him as a complex, all of love, so that nothing but love was to come out of him. So much so that my love and his were to be in continuous currents. But man not only did not love me, but ungrateful, he offended me. And I had to repay my divine father for this lack of love. And I had to accept a death of love for each one, and another of pain for the offenses. But while he was saying this, I saw my sweet Jesus all in one flame that consumed him and gave him death for each one. Even more, I could see that each thought, word, motion, work, step, and so forth, were as many flames that consumed Jesus and vivified him. 
Then Jesus added, Would you not want my likeness? Would you not accept the deaths of love as you accepted the deaths of pain? And I, Oh my Jesus, I don't know what happened to me. I still feel great repugnance for having accepted those of pain. How could I accept those of love that seem harder to me? I tremble at the mere thought of it. My poor nature is annihilated more. It is undone. Help me. Give me strength. For I feel I cannot go on any more. And Jesus, all goodness but determined, added, Poor daughter of mine, courage. Do not fear, and do not want to trouble yourself because of the repugnance you feel. Rather, in order to reassure you, I tell you that this too is likeness to me. You must know that also my humanity, as holy as it was, and immensely eager to suffer, felt this repugnance. But it was not my own. Those were all the repugnances that creatures would feel in doing good, in accepting the pains that they deserved. And I had to suffer these pains that tortured me not a little in order to give them the inclination to good and to render the pains sweeter for them. So much so that in the garden I cried out to the Father, If it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. Do you think it was I? Ah, no, you deceive yourself. I loved suffering to folly. I loved death to give life to my children. It was the cry of the whole human family that echoed in my humanity. And I, crying out together with them to give them strength, repeated it as many as three times. If it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. I was speaking in the name of all, as if it were my own thing. But I felt crushed. So the repugnance that you feel is not your own. It is the echo of mine. If it were your own, I would have withdrawn. Therefore, my daughter, since I want to generate from myself another image of myself, I want you to accept. And I myself want to mark these, my deaths of love, in your will expanded and consumed within mine. And as he was saying this, he marked me with his holy hand and disappeared. May everything be for the glory of God. July 30th, 1922. Louisa feels repugnance in letting the writings come out. Laments of Jesus In letting copying be done from my writings, in obedience to the confessor, of what Jesus had told me about the virtues, I wanted to have it copied without saying that it was Jesus who had told me that. And he, on coming, displeased, said to me, my daughter, why do you want to hide me? Am I perhaps a dishonored person that you don't want to mention my name? When one speaks of a good, a saying, a work, a truth from a dishonored person, one does not want to say who that person is, so as not to cause the esteem, the glory, the prestige, and the effect contained in that good in that saying, and so forth, to be lost. In fact, if one says who the person is, it shall not be appreciated, and shall lose all its beauty, knowing that the source from which it comes deserves no appreciation. On the other hand, 
if that is a good and honored person, first one mentions the name of that person to make what he said or did stand out more and be more appreciated. And then one tells what he did or said. So do I not deserve that my name be placed before my words? Ah, how badly you treat me. I did not expect this sorrow from you. Yet I have been so generous with you. I have manifested to you many things about me. I have let you know many things, and the most intimate ones about me, which I have not done with others. You should have been more generous in making me known. Instead, the most sparing? Others, with the little I told them, would have set up trumpets in order to make me known and loved. You instead want to hide me? I don't like this at all. And I, almost confounded and humiliated to the summit, said to him, My Jesus, forgive me. You are right. It is because of the great repugnance I feel. This having to put my will into how I should come out tortures me. You have pity on me. Give me more strength and grace, and make my heart larger, that I may never again give you this sorrow. And Jesus, I bless you, so that your heart may receive more grace, and may be more generous in making me known and loved. August 2nd, 1922, likeness to Jesus in his greatest pain, the abandonment of the divinity in his pains. Finding myself in my usual state, I saw myself all confounded and as though separated from my sweet Jesus, to the point that as he came, I said to him, my love, how things have changed for me. Before, I used to feel so identified with you that I felt no division between you and me. And in the very pains I suffered, you were with me. Now the complete opposite. If I suffer, I feel separated from you. And if I see you before me or inside of me, it is in the appearance of a judge who condemns me to the penalty, to death. And you no longer take part in the pains that you yourself give me. Yet you tell me, rise more and more, while I am descending. And Jesus, interrupting my speaking, told me, my daughter, how you are deceiving yourself. This is happening because you accepted, and I marked, the deaths and the pains that I suffered for each creature. My humanity also found itself in these painful conditions. It was inseparable from my divinity, yet since my divinity was untouchable by the pains, nor capable of suffering any shadow of pain, my humanity found itself alone in suffering and my divinity was only the spectator of the pains and deaths that I suffered. Even more, it was my inexorable judge, who wanted to be paid the penalty of each pain of each creature. Oh, how my humanity trembled. I remained crushed before that supreme light and majesty in seeing myself covered with the sins of all and with the pains and deaths that each one deserved. It was the greatest pain of my life, that while I was one with the divinity and inseparable from it, in the pains I remained alone and as though apart. So since I have called you to my likeness, what is the wonder if, while you feel me within you, 
You see me as the spectator of your pains that I myself inflict upon you, and you feel as though separated from me. Yet your pain is nothing but the shadow of mine, and just as my humanity was never separated from the divinity, so I assure you that you are never separated from me. These are the effects that you feel, but then more than ever do I form one single thing with you. Therefore, courage, faithfulness, and do not fear. August 6, 1922. The will of God is balance and order. I felt all immersed in the holy will of God, and my sweet Jesus on coming told me, My daughter, all things have equal weight for me. The weight of heaven is equal for me to that of the earth. My will contains perfect balance. Balance brings order, regimen, utility, harmony, all things harmonize together as if they were one single thing. Order brings equality. Equality brings likeness. This is why there is so much harmony, order, and likeness in the three divine persons. And all created things are in perfect harmony. One is the support, the strength, and the life of the other. If just one created thing disharmonized, all the others would tumble and end up in ruin. Only man moved away from us, from the balance of our will. Oh, how man tumbled, and from the highest place he fell into the deepest abyss. And in spite of my redemption, not all of the human family has returned to its original state. This means that the gravest thing is to withdraw from the balance of our will. It means hurling oneself into chaos, into disorder, into the abyss of all evils. Now, my daughter, this is why I have called you in a special way into this balance of my will, so that as you live in it, you may come to balance the whole operating of deranged humanity. By living in my will, you shall balance yourself. You shall be in order and in perfect harmony with us and with all things created by us. So, since you harmonize everything, we shall feel you flowing in the sphere of our will, giving us the order and the harmony of all the intelligences, words, works, and steps of all. We shall constitute your acts in our will as rulers of all the others, and we shall make up for the chaos of misfortunate humanity. Each act of yours shall be like the mark of the order that we shall receive in the name of all others. You have much to do in our will. You shall be like a queen who shall bring us all conquests, all harmonies. Our will shall administer to you everything that is necessary, so that you may make up for all before us, and fill the void of balance of the human will, that received so much harm in withdrawing from the balance of our will. August 12, 1922. Value and Effects of Sacrifice I felt oppressed and in pain in such a way that only my sweet Jesus can know. He scrutinizes each fiber of my poor heart and sees all the intensity of my torment. Having compassion for me on coming, he sustained me in his arms, telling me, My daughter Courage, I am here for you. What do you fear? Have I perhaps failed you? And if you do not feel like moving the slightest from my will at any cost, much less do I feel like not being with you, 
and life of each act and pain of yours. Now you must know that my will is most pure gold, and so that the thread of your will may become most pure gold in such a way that, as the thread of your will is braided with mine, one would not be able to distinguish what one is yours and what one is mine. It takes only sacrifice and pains. Consuming the thread of your human will, they substitute it with a golden divine thread that, identifying itself with mine, forms one single thread and braiding the whole great wheel of eternity extends everywhere and finds itself in every place. But if my will is gold and yours is iron, you shall remain behind and mine shall not lower itself to be braided with yours. If you take two objects of gold, though each one may have its own different shape, by melting them, you shall be able to form one single object and would no longer be able to distinguish the gold of one from that of the other. But if one object is of gold and the other of iron, one shall not stick to the other, and it shall be impossible to form one single object of gold. So only sacrifice changes the nature of the human will. Sacrifice is burning fire that melts and consumes. Sacrifice is sacred and has the virtue of consecrating the divine will in the human. Sacrifice is grace, and with its skillful brush, it impresses the divine form and features. Here is the reason for the increasing of your pains. These are the final brush strokes that are needed in order to give the final extension and braiding of your will with mine. And I, ah, my Jesus, all my pains, as painful as they are, such that they seem to annihilate me, do not oppress me. And if it pleases you, multiply them for me. But you know what one is the pain that torments me. For that one alone, I implore your compassion, for it seems that I cannot go on any more. Please, for pity's sake, help me and free me, if it pleases you. And Jesus, my daughter, in this pain also I shall be with you. I shall be your help. I shall give you my strength in order to bear it. I could make you content, but it would not be decorous for me to do that. A work so high a mission so sublime and unique, calling you to live life in my will? It would sound odd to me if I did not make it pass through the organ of my church. Besides, it was with my will and with the intervention of obedience to a minister of mine that you were placed in this state. If he does not feel like continuing, he can give you the obedience so that as you would do it to obey, there would still be perfect accord between you and me. In fact, if you did it on your own, of your own will, not only would we not remain in accord, but you would remain disfigured. However, they must know that the world is currently on a stake, and if they don't want me to raise its flames higher, and burn everything to ashes, then they should do what I want. I remain terrified and more afflicted than before, but ready to do his most holy will, not mine. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 14, Part 8. Fiat. 